Hello my computer audience over there. Today I'm going to make you a different type of a video and my goal over here is to not teach you anything. I'm trying to learn and I'm reading this book about operating systems. It's a very advanced book and I'm going to in short clips explain to you some terms I read in the book as I understood them. That's my plan. Okay, so the first computer term I have for you over here is swapping. And what does swapping mean? It means that when you are running out of RAM or random access memory, the volatile memory in your computer that empties when you turn off the electricity. When you run out of that because you have too many programs or the programs take too much memory, the operating system starts to put that into your swap and your, the swap is on your hard drive and it, your hard drive is of course much 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 slower than for example your RAM memory but nowadays you know we have NVMe SSDs and this is one of the reasons you should have the fastest you know uh, SSD possible because then if for example in a video editing project you run into the problem that you are running out of memory then the operating system can offload to your swap you know the project and your computer doesn't crash and that's also one of the reasons you should have ample space open on your hard drive swapping that's it Okay, so the next computer term, time sharing. This is a really old fashioned computer term. Time sharing can be kind of explained nowadays in a very different manner. But in the past, time sharing meant a server that a couple of different users or many users could use at the same time. And that was like way back in time, you know? And those users used something called the terminal. Nowadays the terminal, you know it as the Unix terminal probably. But they used terminals, not computers in themselves. They just accessed the processing power of the backplane, you know, server, for example, in universities. And those machines, they were called time machine, I mean time sharing machines. You know, and over here there's a, a machine called CDC 6600. Might have been one of those old, old, you know, mega big computers. That's time sharing. So this is the next term, inode. What's an inode? What I understood from here is that when files are written, they are first written in memory, you know, random access memory. And when files have been written, an inode has been created. And the inode includes in itself all the address spaces in the memory blocks on the hard drive that the computer has to seek to find those files. So an inode is kind of faster to handle by the computer than the actual files. So when a computer opens up a file or searches for a file or uses a file, it first goes to the inode and the inode contains where that actual file is contained. Kind of like when you don't know in a place for a supermarket, for example, where one item is, you go and you ask, you know, the inode is kind of like the worker there working and she or he will tell you, it's over there. <laughs> you know, that's an inode. Computers are very humane in how they work, but they're just very hard to understand and get to work. But we have done it. That's an inode. Okay, so the next computer term I have for you over here is hardware-assisted virtualization. What is that? 
Well, you should know about virtual machines at this point. I have told you about that. But what is hardware assisted virtual machines or hardware assisted virtualization? It's when the virtualizing software doesn't have to create kind of a virtual processor, you know, so to say, for the virtual machine. So it doesn't have to use processing power to create that uh, or to use that processor, you know, in the virtual machine. It can tap directly into the processing power of your uh, processor and Intel has a technology called Intel VTX and that usually has to be uh, turned on in the BIOS and there's AMD V also that serves the same purpose and you can look into this it's not that probably important for you but if you are running virtual machines in some server situation you have to know about this this is fucking important you know there thanks for watching because otherwise you will be uh, wasting much resources you know if you don't understand how to utilize this okay so the next computer term i have for you over here this is quite advanced i don't know if i understood this color correctly but the word is binder proxy. What's a binder proxy? I understand from here that a binder proxy is when a process calls something and that call, you know, has to be transmitted to the kernel, the core of the operating system, and then transmitted through the kernel to another program. That's when you use a binder proxy uh, in case of Unix, Linux and Android. This is like Unix and Linux and Android specific stuff then. And the process number two then has a binder. And the binder proxy is kind of like the sender and the binder is then kind of like a receiver but not really a receiver you know but that's how the process 2 gets the message of the process 1 I might be completely wrong about that though binder proxy okay so the next computer term I have for you over here is capability list and what is this uh, in Linux and I believe this is Linux specific, but we are talking about the user space and what the user space uh, process uh, has access to in the kernel space. So in Unix the kernel space and the user space are divided and each process that is running in the user space has certain kind of capability list. So that tells what files and I don't know if it's right that it also determines what resources that uh, process can uh, access. And is this like written by the, like the programmer of the program or does, does the kernel have some kind of playback over here? I have no idea. If you know this better, this term capability list, then write down in the comments all you want, your own explanations, what, what it means. This is, this is almost completely on top of my... I understand the concept very clear, you know. I've been a Linux user for six years, you know, seven years. So yeah, I understand this, but... Uh, yeah, it's been, it's quite a lot, quite over my head, you know. <laughs> okay, so the next term over here is thin client, and that's a term that kind of is a you know the modern equivalent of the old X terminal, for example, for the Unix operating system and the time sharing machines. A thin client is something like the Chromebook, you know. It's mainly using outside server you know, power and accessing files on the internet, for example. 
and it's no longer you know uh, it no longer has you know as much hard drive space you can probably store the files you know on the computer uh, you can probably run programs directly on the computer uh, you have to run them uh, through a web interface and over here good question will we have a time when all like programs and are done that way you know web-based programs i think i'm going to make a video a whole video about that but yeah that's thin clients very like understandable you know like chromebooks and uh yeah i i i agree with this you know this is where we are heading you know with computing but i'm gonna make a whole video about that